we're going to start recording. Okay. We're going to start doing all that fun stuff. So you might have Got a few it. things you have to hit on your screen in a little bit. So um, while we're letting Facebook, because it does look like we're live there now. So while we're letting them notify everybody that we're here. Hello, Jennifer. Hello, Zoe. Hi. Hi. Good. <laughs> so good to have you both back. Okay. Remind me. We did this, Jennifer, for you. Was it July of last year? Oh my goodness. I think it was late July. It's all yeah. a blur, but I think it's so. all a blur. But I yeah. think it was around July. I was telling the ladies in the green room, I said I just have to flip my my um my intro around. <laughs> so I'll be introducing <laughs> Zoe first this time and Jennifer second. <laughs> Yeah, but it seems so it. long ago. That, that July, I mean, you think it's not really that many months, but it, I, I thought it feels like it was a feels really like years long ago. time ago. Yeah. yeah. It's like it, a lifetime. And yeah. it, but it's not. It's so it's crazy. Not. It was it's like, like a blink of an than, eye. Yeah. This so it's bizarre. It's long and close. Mm -hmm. Time, time during these past two years is good, just so weird. And I'm sure you both, it's like, because when you try and think of like, oh, we just did, did that two years ago, it's like, no, we were still in COVID two years ago. So it's like, I'm referring to things that happened in like 2018 and 2019. Yeah. Yes. Um, so it's like these like 20 and 21. It's like, oh, I don't even know. But anyway, no. I yeah. completely no, digress. <laughs> <laughs> we could go on a whole subject about just how we feel about like COVID world events. I mean, yeah. you name it. We can totally. be, we can be, but we're going to give everybody a little bit of a bomb and talk about travel and writing and all kinds of wonderful things. So it's so great to have both of you back here um, again with us. So if you are joining us on Facebook, I'm going to be chatting with you in there and letting you know how to order Zoe's book from us. I'll give you a quick little link. Um, just so you know, real quick, if you're not familiar with Warworks and you're watching us, we're located in La Jolla, San Diego, California. So if you are in San Diego and you want to come by and pick up that book, we'd love to see you or we can ship that to you. Just let us know when you're placing that order. Also in that comment section, if you're watching this on YouTube, we're not live with you, but you're going to see a great conversation. So stay with us. Um, but if you are on Facebook live with us right now for the live event, uh, go ahead and put any questions that you have for Zoe or Jennifer in that comment section and I'll bring those to them. Um, at about the half hour, 40, 35 minute mark is what I'll do. And for those of you, I'm going to be playing with my bangs because I'm trying to grow them out and they're driving me crazy. So just letting you know that too. <laughs> All right. Zoe. Oh, I know I was going to designy. Yeah. I <laughs> oh, got it. <laughs> designy holds a master's degree in art history and taught college courses for 30 years. She also worked as an art gallery director a lecturer for the Norton Simon Museum of Art, and most recently as a lecturer for Rhodes Scholar, an educational travel organization for adults. So he has led numerous art tours in Europe and at one point established a business in Paris offering art history adventures for American tourists. She's here today to talk to us about her just released book, The Art of Traveling Strangers. And joining, yay, and joining her is Jennifer Dassel. Jennifer is a former curator of modern and contemporary art at the North Carolina Museum of Art in Raleigh, North Carolina, and the host of the independent podcast, Art Curious, which she started in 2016, and which was named one of the best podcasts by O, the Oprah Magazine, and PC Magazine. She holds an MA in Art History from the University of Notre Dame and a BA in Art History from the University of California, Davis. She has also completed PhD coursework in art history at Pennsylvania State University, and she lectures frequently on art, both locally and nationally. Ladies, have a great conversation. See you in a little bit. Thanks, Julie. Thank you. Hi. Hi. <laughs> I am so happy to be able to be in conversation with you again because we've been in touch. I think I, I can't remember exactly when I first was you know, I'm so grateful to have received a galley early on, a digital galley for your book. Was that like two years ago? I feel like it was pre-pandemic, but time again is a blur, yeah. but yeah. it's been a while. It's all a blur. <laughs> right. It's, it's blur. all a blur. Yeah. But it's been wonderful because we've been able to be in touch this whole time. And now we are here and your book is out into the world and it's yeah. happened. It is, so it happened. congratulations. And I'm sure you're just you know, over the moon right now. I am. 
I am a little dazed, a little dazed and confused, but also over the moon. <laughs> I can imagine. I know it's like a whole mix of emotions going on for sure. Yeah. Um, so Julie gave us a wonderful introduction, but I wanted to start by asking you to tell us a little bit more about your background. So we know that you have this incredible grounding in history and in travel, which obviously both I massively approve of, bravo. <laughs> um, but you've also then added this new element to your resume. So when did you realize that you wanted to be an author? Um, not in... I was going to say recently, but it took me a long time to write this book. So not until I decided to write this book, actually. Um, I was thinking about this the other day. I thought, well, when did I, when did this all happen to me? Well, actually, when I was in high school and college, I used to write rhyming poems, like really, really bad rhyming poems. You know, they had I love to be. It. No, not, not such thing as bad. No, they um. had to be the real old fashioned, straight laced, absolutely had to rhyme. Um, and I used to write song lyrics that I thought were wonderful. Um, but of course, it was just all for fun. And then um, when I went on into adulthood after that, and I had a child, I thought, well, maybe I'll write children's stories. And I yeah. thought that would be kind of cool. And um, they also had to all be in rhyme. So, oh, so I started it. writing. I took a correspondence course. You know, in those days, there was no online yeah. education. So right. I took a correspondence course and um, I would write these stories in rhyme and they all had to teach a lesson. So one was about how you shouldn't eat too many sweets. Mm -hmm. And one was about what opposites are. Oh. And I, I still have them and I've read them recently and they're so hysterically terrible. Oh no. <laughs> so my, my, um, my professors who were corresponding with me were very, very sweet and kind and actually gave me a lot of marvelous tips. But in the end, they said, you know, there is absolutely no market for rhyming children's stories. Dr. Seuss has the market and oh. no one's going to want to, you know, do that. So I thought, okay, never mind. So then I started teaching and um, I thought, okay, I'm going to do an art appreciation textbook. Yeah. I thought that'd be pretty fun to do. And I was really interested in doing that. So I wrote a few chapters and I'm not sure who I gave it to, but someone who seemed to know a whole lot more than I did about publishing um, said, well, this is fine, but you know, nobody knows who you are and you have no reputation. And we only publish, you know, as you know, textbooks are published by the name Art Historians. So I also still have that book. <laughs> and I looked at that the other day and I looked at the title. Okay, this is an art appreciation textbook supposedly and yeah. I titled it goddesses don't come along every day <laughs> it's, it's like a novel I, mean, I kind of love it but yes it doesn't scream <laughs> art appreciation to me even though there are obviously a lot of goddesses in art history but yeah. <laughs> I so like it. it it could have just been the title that absolutely put the kibosh on that one so anyway that was it so I didn't do anything more and then um 2013, I was going out to lunch with a girlfriend and I was telling her some stories about the days when I was doing tour guiding in Europe. And at the end of one story, she said, oh, you should write that. And for the first time ever, I thought, I'm gonna be an author. I, here is my story, here's the germ of a story and I'm gonna write that, so. I love that. I mean, how wonderful is it this is moment that's almost like a light bulb moment. It that was. You realized that, yeah. that's awesome. And you made it happen, which is, you know, gutsy and amazing and brave and all of those good things. I, I love it. And obviously I love the book too. So I wanted to show everybody, I know that Julie's going to tell everyone how we can buy the copy through Warwick's, but for sure, it is such a wonderful read. And I know that Julie also called it a balm for the soul, which I completely agree that it is especially in the last couple of years, I, there's nothing more that I've wanted to do than to travel and go to Europe and go to see all these incredible works of art. So you were able to kind of take me there. So thank you so much for rescuing me. Yeah, me too. I was taking me there as well. So that That's was a good point. Yeah. So when you started writing this in 2013, or did you take a little no. bit extra time after that? Okay. No, I've been writing and writing. I'm extremely slow. I'm just ridiculously slow I and am I also, too so I relate yeah and this wasn't I mean this I'm an art historian yeah um I don't know a lot about the whole writing world so it's been right. 
a huge learning curve, a, a fascinating learning curve. But um, so it was slow. It was slow. Well, it's a different skill set too, which is what's also really interesting because writing uh, fiction is such a different way than writing about art, even though you're able to merge those somewhat when you're talking about describing a location or a work of art, but it is a different beast altogether. So I can imagine I'm not a fiction writer myself, but I can imagine that if I tried to sit down that I wouldn't know where to begin. So how, how did you start? What was the, uh, how did you actually get into the process of carving out this story for the first time? I had a kernel of a story that really happened. So it was based on one of the one of the tours I did when I was in Europe, and it was a very, very unusual experience, um, like nothing else I had ever done. And it was funny and it was um, it was just unique. And I told that I used to tell that story all the time and um, everybody loved the story. And I thought, well, I should write that. Well, that story was like this long <laughs> after I wrote it all down. And I thought, well, what is that? That's not a novel. That's not even a novella. That's I don't know what this is. And of course, I was so sure it was a novel. I went to a conference and I took it around to agents and I said, look at my great story. And they just said, well, what do you want to do with this? He said, well, I want to publish it. I said, oh, no. What else would you do with it? <laughs> you need to put more in it. So then, so then the really hard part came where it was, how do I develop this story? So it sort of went backwards. Instead of having an overarching plan, it started with a kernel and, and expanded out. So that also took longer. I I love that though, because it's really interesting just to get a kind of a backstage view at how people come up with ideas. So I want to talk about um, the story a little bit. So you're talking about that it came from a kernel. So we have this story of Claire's development, especially as we're moving from her divorce and her mother's death, her, her breakup, um, you know, her rocky finances, all of the tragedies kind of at the very beginning that then spur her on into taking this opportunity to go to Europe. And we see her growing in self-confidence and becoming more insured, uh, self-assured, I suppose, and empowered as she travels through Italy and then onward to Paris. What parts of the story were easiest for you to put on paper and what were the ones that were more challenging? Well, the, actually, the parts of the story I liked writing the most, um, which I guess makes makes them the easiest. Yeah, um, I liked I liked my my sidekick Viv that I that I created. Um, she came from that kernel, but she is nothing like the kernel as it, <laughs> as it evolved. But I she was so much fun to write about because she was so much fun and yeah. she was so off the wall and she had such colorful language and I'm so attracted to unique patterns of speech. Yeah. Um, my dad uh, made up words all the time and oh, he made fun. up phrases and words and my sister does too. And so I love the idea of uh, coming up with your own way of saying things. Yeah. And then my, um, my, my first mother-in-law was from Texas and she had that real authentic Texan way of talking and just her just her colloquialisms that she used were so vividly visual that I, I absolutely love to listen to her talk. So that was fun for me. So I could do that with Viv. Um, yeah, that was, that was the most fun part. The part that was harder was to do Claire. I was wondering, were they, they kind of almost, they're not like polar, or polar opposites or polarities by any means, but I can see how they would be different more difficult to write kind of in comparison to one another. So Viv was easier and Claire was harder? Claire was harder because she was so serious and she was in so much pain and she was so lost. So in order to try to make that genuine, the only person to go to is of course yourself. And that's not a whole lot of fun, you know, to kind of dig down and remember those painful times in your life and how you can make that real for, for your character. So, um, they were both good, just one was a whole lot more fun. <laughs> to I totally write. get that. I want to ask you a little bit about the title because I wanted to know where you came up with the title. I think it's so lovely and so evocative, but when I take it kind of literally, I don't see Claire and Viv as strangers exactly. Uh, so where, where did you come from with the title? The title has a long history. Um, 
I started out calling it the, um, the accidental education. Hmm. And I named it that because I love the movie, the accidental tourist. Yeah. And I sort of thought there was kind of a similarity there, but there, there is, but there really isn't. And so I thought that that title didn't really do it. It was great for the movie. It wasn't great for my book. So then I, <laughs> so then I tried to come up with more titles and each new one I came up with, it was worse. The next one was the unexpected education. The next one after that was the fashionable education. I thought these are terrible. I, you know, they just, they weren't working. So then I started brainstorming. This took me months. I started Titles are hard. Yeah. Titles are not easy. How'd you come up with your, I shouldn't ask you that yet. Tell me how Ooh. you came up with your title. With Art Curious? Yeah. I don't actually quite remember it being anything other than like, oh, that's going to be the title. I, it wasn't a huge brainstorm, I suppose. So I don't well, have a good story, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> that's a perfect title. For, I mean, absolutely. Perfect. Thank so, okay. you. But so yes, I have brainstorming. I was brainstorming and then put a bunch of words down, you know, as you do, and then yeah. tried to put them together into titles. And I came up with some that were kind of fun. I actually still have the list. So I went back to look at it the <gasps> other day. One was um, Art Tour Detour. And I love thought, it, the rhymes. Yeah, of course. <laughs> or the similarities, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. And one was Derailed by Design. Ooh. But still, they just, for me, that didn't, that didn't work. So yeah. nothing was working. And it was one of those deals where, you know, you go to bed and you wake up the next morning and then the art of traveling strangers was running through my head. So oh my gosh, for me, it, it captured what I wanted to capture. I wanted to show that these two women were really total strangers, did mm -hmm. not know each other at all, ended yeah. up traveling together, just the two of them for this period of time. And through that time had to get to know each other, which turned out to be a very interesting process. Yeah. And so the fact that they started out as strangers was important to me. Yeah. And of course, the traveling was big. And then the art of traveling strangers was how they learned how to travel together. But of course, all the art that they saw as they were traveling. Uh, to me, that just was the title. It so. flows. I think it's so evocative and it's beautiful. And it does make you want to know like, ooh, I want to jump into the story a little bit. Yeah, so yes, exactly. So talking about that art that you mentioned, I mean, Obviously, two art historians talking, we could talk for days about art on yeah. every level, but this yeah. book is a delight, I think, for art lovers. And I wanted to ask you about the locations and the museums and also the works of art that you specifically chose to present to the, your readers. Um, one of my favorite parts of the book is when Claire and Viv go to Ravenna and they go to see those amazing Byzantine mosaics. I wanted to ask if there were specific works of art or locations that you knew off the bat you wanted to include. And were there ones that had some special meaning perhaps not only for you, but also you knew would have special intent and meaning for your characters? Yeah, it, it started out again, there was that kernel of a story, which really helped me with figuring out how I was gonna make this tour happen um, because those actually were the places that oh, I went to. Um, so in that regard, that that gave me a little bit of a, of a, a scaffolding to work with. And yeah. of course, if you're gonna to go to Milan, you're gonna do the Last Supper. So, I mean, that was a given. Um, to go out to uh, Count Ponza's villa, uh, which of course is a little bit different because most of the artwork is very historical as opposed to artists who are contemporary artists. Um, but that experience actually did happen. Um, not exactly the way I wrote it, but we did get to go to Count Ponza's villa. And so oh. I wanted that in the story as well. And, yeah. and that really helped that whole other thing start evolving about how what, what Terrell does so much with, with illusion and perception. Ooh, and that yeah. kind of started me thinking about that art in general and, and all those kinds of things. So as I said, this sort of grew from a, from a kernel in ways that I had no idea it was going to grow. So then that I had that, then I sort of wanted to weave it in to the rest of the story. Yes. Um, so that was, that was how all that worked. And Ravenna is my, the Ravenna mosaics are among my, it's hard to say that, isn't it? You know, this is not true. We don't have, we have 9 million favorites. <laughs> all of um, them. <laughs> but yeah, but the mosaics of Ravenna are just, um, I don't know. I, I, I love, I love the, the two women, Gala Placidia and, and Theodora, the Byzantine Empress Theodora and, and their stories and their, and the beautiful artwork that's in such incredible condition. Yes. Um, oh my gosh. They're from what, like the fifth century or fourth century? Something they're, they're ancient. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. So they're incredible. Yeah. 
So I love the way that you were able to weave them in. And then it really seemed like it, it was a, a wonderful point for Viv because she seemed to want to really know more and be drawn in to Theodora's story. I, and I loved that because it was this wonderful way to reflect about art history and make it mean something in the moment. Um, I think that's sometimes something that I've struggled in the past is with uh, I lovingly call it the old stuff because I've spent so much of my professional career working with modern and contemporary artists, but my deep love is for more historical art. And sometimes it's about finding the way to connect to those works of art in a way that's meaningful. And I, I love that scene in particular because I feel like you do that so well for your characters. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah Were there I, any- I like, that. I like that idea too. You know, I wanted- yeah. I want I wanted readers to see art as something that was still alive and meaningful. Yes. Um, because a lot of people think the old stuff is just that, you know, old yeah. stuff that's yeah. been dead a long time and who cares? But it really the best of art never is dead. So it's exactly. just Exactly. Oh. Speaking to my heart right now, so much, yeah. and all all art people. No, I totally agree and I love that, you know, it, it allows us, even, even if it's fiction, it still allows us to be able to enjoy those works of art in a different way and in a new way. And you give us a, a you know, fresh perspective through someone else's eyes. And that always changes the work of art for us a little bit. And I think yeah. that's really special. So um, was there a special work of art in particular? You said that that was one of your favorites. Were there any others in the book that you were you knew you wanted to include specifically? Um, I wanted to include them all. <laughs> I know. Um, but you know, the Terrell's work, um, I was really, I was really happy to include that piece. Yeah. Because he, because he does work in a modern, modern genre, modern time. And, and, and what he does is really pretty amazing in such a non-traditional way. Yeah. Um, and he does play so much. The same as I mentioned in the book, it's kind of the same thing Leonardo da Vinci was doing in his Last Supper. He's playing with space. Yeah. But they're playing with space in two very different ways. One one artist takes a flat wall and through the use of linear perspective makes that flat wall disappear and looks like it's three dimensional. And the other artist takes a three dimensional space and makes it collapse into a flat square. So they're both dealing with space. I, that was really fun for me to pull that together. I, I love that. I haven't put that together before. So. No, and I don't think I had either. And so I love it because you're helping you're helping me see these people and their works of art in new ways as well. Um, speaking of favorites, you know, I mentioned that this book really allowed me to feel like I was traveling at a point where I was stuck at home, um, still kind of am stuck in place for a lot of it. But were there, you talked about that these were based on the tours that you took. Were there specific favorite travel spots that you wanted to include? And what are your, you know, your top three places to travel in the world? Oh, you're so cruel. Um, I know, sorry. <laughs> um, you okay, you know, some of the travel spots that we love a lot are so overrun with everybody else who loves them as well. And I think that's yeah. wonderful, but it changes them. I mean, yeah. I think a long time ago, I would have said that Florence is one of my favorite travel spots and it's, it's still the most, one of the most magnificent cities anywhere for art. Yeah, It's just hard to experience it the same way I was able to a long time ago. Now, if I had never done it a long time ago, I'm sure I'd feel differently about that. So yeah. that would have been one I would have, I would have put up there. You know what though, still, uh, Rome is still a very, very favorite for me. Uh -huh. um, I got to live there for a while when my parents lived there and um, I got to know it. And it's such a gigantic city that's hard to know when you're a visitor, yeah. I think. But if you have some, a chance to spend some time there, it has so, it's so big and it has so much history and so much art. Um, I think Rome is pretty, is pretty spectacular still. Yeah. And I, as I said, I love Ravenna. And you know, Venice is very much like um, what I was saying about Florence, if, if not I agree. more so. Um, such a unique, beautiful city. Yeah. But um, if you go to Venice just to go to the Biennale, which is happening this year, I know. Um, and you stay out on the Lido, 
yeah we'll take the vaporetto back and forth you know to that back part where all yeah. the art not all the artwork but most of the artwork is and just avoid the, the town so I that's totally recommend that that sounds yeah. like an amazing <laughs> idea yeah yeah so that's I don't know you have to do you have to kind of do workarounds I guess with that kind of thing I love that though because you're again you're you're combining your art knowledge and your travel knowledge to give us these little insider tips to make enjoying both so much easier and I'm with you I mean going to the Biennale is something that I've had the you know the privilege of doing a few times but I agree it's like Florence where it is so crowded uh, that it's hard to really appreciate what you're seeing because you're struggling. I wanted to actually ask you, and I, I meant to mention this earlier, but I wanted to ask you about the time period. So the book takes place in the 80s, and I wanted to ask you what was your uh, decision in having that be the time period? You know, you could have written it in any period in history. It could have be uh, something that takes place in the 21st century. So I would love to know about the, the 80s and why you chose that. Well, that was an easy one for me. First of all, because of my, the real story actually did take place in the 80s. And that's when I was doing all this kind of traveling that I mentioned, you know, when I was doing these tours for students and then doing independent tours for adults and then and trying to start my own business in Paris, all that pretty much happened in the, in the 80s. Um, so that's when I had the most um, repeated exposure to being in Europe and to being in Europe from the point of view of someone who was teaching other people about the artwork as opposed to going on my own now when I'm not nearly as diligent about, you know, I go and look at stuff and I love it or I leave or, you know, I don't have that same kind of intense experience art historically. So right. that was, again, it was just easier for me to write yeah. that period. And that well, also that helped bring in, sense. yeah, that also helped bring in some other things that I had not originally thought about bringing in about actually being in the 80s. So I had a chance mm. to kind of expand now that it's not quite history, but almost history, um, expand a way of looking at the 80s uh, more holistically. So that was, that was an interesting thing for me to do, for me to do in the book. How did that change your perspective on the characters, for example? Um, well, I think, I think it was, it helped me to bring in issues about um, the gay community. Yeah. Because that was such a, 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 a horrible time period and a, and a wake up call for most of us. Um, yeah. And that seemed to fit naturally, especially when you talk about the artists that, that we were seeing. And, and I don't know, that just seemed like a good opportunity to be able to talk about those, those things. So yeah, that changed it. Too. I like that. That's a great point. I mean, yeah, that wouldn't be something that would be naturally, um, I think, slotted into the conversation as well now, because for, for so many people, it's not an issue anymore because it's so much more accepted and legalized. And, you know, there's it's, it's normal in so many ways. Yeah, so I love that. That's a great point. I hadn't considered that before. Um, I want to know a little bit, there's obviously no lack of great books out there, novels, especially about art and about travel and having these wonderful life-changing experiences. But I feel like yours is different and I want to know your perspective. What makes your book unique? Well, you know, of course, as I was writing and learning what writers are supposed to do and how you're supposed to write, you know, sort of as I was going along, one of the things they kept saying is, you know, make sure you know what makes your book stand out. You know, if you're going to try to pitch it to an agent, you want to make sure that agent understands what what is special about your take on this topic. That's that's a very popular art and travel, very popular topics. So that took me a while because I really wasn't writing it from that point of view, I wasn't trying to be unique. I was just trying to write it. Yeah. So I think, I think there's two things that are a little not typical about the way I did this novel. One is um, that I was, as I apparently have always been doing anytime I was writing, even those children rhyming stories, I'm a teacher. I'm just, yeah. I'm a teacher. So um, I wanted to entertain which you have to do when you teach in order for people to even hear you and, and listen. Totally. And, yeah. And I wanted to, and I wanted to teach, I wanted to teach a little crash course in a sliver of Western art history, but still tell a story that would hopefully keep people engaged. So yes. most novels 
don't do that necessarily. You know, they certainly a lot of novels are extremely informational. Yeah. Um, and those are the novels I like the best. But yeah. this was a, a little didactic. It was like, and here's your lesson for today, Viv. So, <laughs> um, so I think that for good or for bad, I don't know. I think that's one thing that makes it a little bit different. And yeah. the book that um, that inspired me to do that or actually spurred me on, I guess, is I don't know if you're familiar with the book Sophie's World. It was written by an author named um, Justine Garter. He's a Norwegian. He's a Norwegian. Familiar. Is this some um, uh, like a youthful, like a young adult or a child series? It's well, it, it's it's one book, but he wrote children's. He wrote children's stories, and he okay. supposedly was writing this for children. But it, I don't understand how any child would. I mean, it's hard for adults. It was hard for me. Yeah. <laughs> I loved it because he tells this really great story. I mean, a really great story. But as he's telling this great story, you're getting the whole uh, philosophy 101. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. In this book. And I just thought that was the most amazing thing. It took me a while to get through it because I thought, oh, I don't know, I don't know, but it is so worth, I think, getting to the end. So that was real inspirational to me. I thought if I could write a story that kept people engaged through the the lessons yeah um, if I can make those engaging too then I've then I've done the two together so that yeah. that was really exciting to me and then the other thing about um, my story that I think is different is it is not a historical novel mm -hmm. but it talks mm -hmm. a lot about history um, yes. it takes you back to those historical time periods it gives you insights into those artists who lived there at the time and what they were going through but you're not really in that time in the, in the novel the novel doesn't right. take place in that time so i think that's a little different also i like that because you get to learn about leonardo without being next to leonardo while he paints the last supper for example so yeah. no i think that's great um if there was a, i suppose what's next for your characters because you leave it a little bit open at the end. Is there going to be a sequel or, or are we going to follow any more of Claire and Viv's journeys? What's going on next in your world? Um, I, of course, have thought of a sequel. You know, that would kind of be a natural thing to kind of flow into. And I like the idea of a sequel because I would do it very similarly. It would still have... Uh, Claire as the protagonist, the art historian, and it would still yeah. be based on art lessons that help you learn how to live your life, which I like that idea. I like um, too. Viv, I don't, I can't see Viv in it anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so I thought, well, maybe I would, maybe I would take a trip with my, um, with Claire's uh, best friend in the, in the story. She has a bit part, it's Mara, and um, she's actually Dutch. And I thought, well, maybe they would go together and something, something, do something. <laughs> um, but it would happen in uh, mostly in, in Paris, because that would be what I would like fun, to do. Fun. If I did it, that would be what I think I'd like to do. So. I mean, I wouldn't say no to reading that for sure. <laughs> that would be right up my personal alley. Uh, what is next for you? personally and professionally, what is coming down the line for you besides any potential writing projects? Do you have any other things that you're working on projects? Are you just relaxing, hopefully, after all the, the work of writing this book? Yeah. Um, <laughs> not at the moment, but that's because we're launching, you know, so it's, there's all these exciting things to do. And um, well, I am writing a newsletter, which it turns out is, is working rather well for the people that have signed up for it. And I'm enjoying Great enjoying writing it because I I have several sections in it and the one section that made me think of doing this is there's so many artists and artworks and styles mentioned in my book and you only get a little sliver yeah. so the newsletter takes you beyond I call it beyond the book and part of it where I'll take an artist or a style or or an artwork and say here's what it says in the book you know here's your little tantalizing information but listen to this and you get, you know, like your art curious, you get all those fun little um, enticing things that you can't really put in the book, but I can put them in my newsletter. So that's been, uh, I've actually really liked that part. So that's been fun. 
that sounds super fun. And now I'm ashamed that I haven't signed up for it yet because I definitely want to. That sounds amazing. Um, hi, hi, Julie. I have a couple hi. more questions. Oh, May keep I? going. Okay, cool. Just I kind of thought you were work. going to the end there, but I was just like, oh, keep going. <laughs> okay, awesome, awesome. Uh, I just wanted to ask you, Zoe, a little bit about this process of writing your first book and getting it out there. I know we've touched on, uh, you know, the nugget of information and how long it took to write and just sort of the process, but I wanted to ask about writing advice. I know that you were mentioning that you had this correspondence course and that you had a number of people who were kind of guiding you along this process over the years. What was the best writing advice that you got, especially as a first time novelist? Yeah, I, there's absolutely one real, real significant to me. So, and, and I'm sure this is what you heard. I think this is what everybody says. And it's almost like the, the basics at the very, very start when you're just starting to write, just get it out. Just get it out, just put it down. Don't, don't pay any attention to the grammar. Don't pay any attention to the right word, to, to syntax, to you know, spelling, nothing. Just get it out. Yeah. And then you go back and edit it because you're going to delete a bunch of it anyway. And the reason that is the best advice for me is because I cannot do that. Yes. I cannot do that. Oh, it's hard. And that's why I'm so slow. Me I have too. to perfect the sentence, even if I'm going to end up deleting it later on, which I might, who knows, I can't go on until that sentence is perfected. And that is so stupid. I mean, any writer who writes a lot would probably say, don't do it that way. Yeah. Um, but I did read um, Annie Dillard, writer Annie Dillard. She wrote an article about um, artist processes Ooh. and she actually explained why someone might write that way. And she said, and this really makes sense to me. She said, there's a reason to write that way because it's like, um, if you have a branch, um, she said it beautifully. And this is a poor paraphrase. She said, you have a branch that's growing out of a tree, for example. And then that branch has to come first before the leaf can come, you know, before the flower can come. And, and they depend on each other to evolve. And you don't know how it's going to go next until you know the thing that goes before. And I thought, that's it. That's exactly what it is. I just wish I didn't do that. <laughs> it's, it's great insane. advice, though. <laughs> it is really good advice. I mean, it's also, it's thoughtful. And it's also nice to know that we're not alone in working that way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. For know. better or for worse. Um, is, you mentioned a little bit about marketing your book and how you knew that you needed to be able to tell what made your story different so that you could go out and touch base with agents and, and make this book a reality. What was that process like for you? Because I know for me, um, I had my book come out and I did some things, but I think it was such a learning process. I kind of learned on the fly. How did you go about that? Well, I'm, go I'm still going about that. That's um, true. That's true. First of all, there is so much information on marketing. Um, I mean, there's, I have folders and folders on my computer and then I forget where they are and I forget what they say. And, but there's a million different things that you can do in marketing and you think, oh, I should do that. I should do that. Well, no, yeah. I should do this. Well, you can't do them all. No. And I, I'm not the best with social media as we were talking about you know, earlier, Facebook. I mean, I, I can do it, but um, so for marketing, the thing that I, I thought I could do, you know, I could hold on to is the idea that you need to make the personal connections. You need to have genuine relationships with people. Yeah. And, you know, that's a part of how I got together with you, Jennifer. Yes. You were someone who I knew I would relate to. And then it's a lot easier to talk to you. It's a yes. lot easier to get excited about what you're doing um, if you feel like you know the person and you're on the same wavelength. So completely, it's like word of mouth stuff, I guess. Yeah. Once it's, again, very slow. But, it's um. slow, but you know what? I mean, it's the age old why independent booksellers are still thriving and doing what they do. And there is just that hand selling word of mouth and not being afraid to brag about your own book. I mean, yeah, that's hard. That's it's true. hard. It's hard, but you kind of have to. And you kind yeah. of have to, you know, if, I mean, there's different people out there that are just like, oh, whatever it does, it does. But if you really want your book to be out there, you can't be afraid to self-promote because that's the world that we're in right now. 
is that it's all social media. It's all self-promotion. We can help that and we can raise it, but it really does now, it really does come directly from authors a lot. Okay. <laughs> it's, a it's a tough one. I know. Do it. Yeah. Do it. It's tough. It's, I mean, it's, even if it's just something simple of just having it on your signature at the bottom of your emails, Yeah. you know, just those kind of things that it's just like that it's just out there. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. It makes perfect sense, but it's, it's hard. Yeah, it is hard. It's hard because no, we I, are, no, no, I, I, and I think women I especially, be. and I think women especially are just kind of like, we're not that yes. like, it doesn't yeah. come quite as naturally to just like boast and be like, yeah. look what yeah. I did. Look what I created. You know? Yeah, yeah it's right. true. Right. But you did, I mean, at the same time, it's like, I, I want, that's why there's this wonderful community of other writers, historians, booksellers, because we want to spur you on. We want you to go out there and say these things because you've done a great thing. You've made this wonderful book, this book from <laughs> scratch. You wrote it, you know, it's like, we want you to praise a piece of, a piece of art it. in its own right, right? <laughs> yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, you know, you're, you're worth it and your book yep. is worth saying stuff like that. Well, well, I didn't I mean, mean to cut you off, Jennifer. If you have no, more questions, no. you want to go. You Please good? continue. Do you have questions from our audience? You know what? We don't have any coming in, but I have some, which I love. Like, yeah, I always have some questions. I um, mean, it's actually for both of you. Oh. So is there, and I'll start with, oh, who am I going to put on the spot first? I think start we'll, with Jennifer. Put, we'll start with Jennifer. We'll put her <laughs> on the spot first. And then we got to so give you time to think. Um <laughs> Is there a piece of art out there that you haven't seen yet that you want to see in person? Yes. Yes. I actually was having this conversation with someone a few days ago because when I was a teenager, I went to London. It is the only time I've been to London to date. So it's been almost 30 years since I was there. And when I was in my teens, I was not interested at all in art. So I didn't go to see any of the museums. I went to the Tower of London. That was it. But I didn't go to the VNA, to the Tate. I didn't go to the National Gallery. So I've missed a lot. And that includes that I have never seen Jan van Eyck's Arnold Beanie portrait, which is one of the big works of art from, you know, early, what would we even say, Zoe? Was that like early Renaissance Flemish? It's Northern Renaissance, yeah. Northern Renaissance. Yeah. It's an incredibly famous work of art. I've never seen it, nor have I ever seen a lot of other works that are based in London. So that's that's high on my list. Hi, I feel like I, I'm seeing a, I'm seeing a trip there in your future. <laughs> oh, I hope so. Put it out no, in the universe. Come put to it me. out there in the universe. London trip. Let's make it yeah. happen. <laughs> Zoe, how about you? Is there one piece of art out there that you haven't seen yet? Oh, there's lots that I haven't seen. But the one um, that's like, I've got to see that one. Well, I have to say for me, in terms of traveling to places, which I've always done to see art. So I try to make sure when I go, I'm going to see all the things that I know that are there that I want to see. Um, of course, the one place, I not of course, but the one place I still have not been to that was has always been number one on my list is Egypt. Mm -hmm. So oh, those too. pieces, um, I'm bound and determined before I, you know, leave this world to go to go see that but but currently right now um i've just gotten really crazy about nikki de saint fal um oh, yeah yeah so, she, so she's she's an artist a french american artist and uh, worked in the in the 70s and in, in 80s uh, and, and on but she is the most not, i'm going to use these superlatives and there's <laughs> people like this she's just a really really uh expressive individual out of the box kind of an artist that that is so her art is so exuberant and so joyful and she had a difficult life she's a survivor in ways um so she made an outdoor garden in italy and i've never been to it it's her taro garden and i don't know if you've ever been to the one that's that's right by you in la jolla um the the mm. um queen calafia's magical circle no it's in, uh, um escondido Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. That's going to be a little east of us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. And it's great. It's it's small. And I know the Taro Garden that in Italy is a lot larger. 
but it's the same, it's, it's her same imagery, it's her same uh, artistic techniques. She does a lot of things with mosaics and tons of different textures. Um, so I was able to see that for the first time during COVID, which was a thrill, you know, because we weren't seeing anything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and that just was kind of the, that just did it. So now I want to go see her tower garden in Italy. So in Italy, there you go. Yeah. Is there, is, okay, <laughs> so here's it. another one. Is there a piece of artwork that's missing that fascinates you still? That's like a missing piece of art that Ooh. it's like, where is that? Or any clues or anything? Is there any one um, piece that's like, where is that? Oh, there's probably several. Oh yeah. Because I, I just I, saw a thing. I can't remember what show I was watching. I was watching something about the Amber Room. And, oh yes. And I was oh. like, that has to just be like, where is that? <laughs> I did a whole episode in my very first season of my podcast on the Amber Room because that's such a fascinating story. Yeah. I went to St. Petersburg. Goodness, it must have been five years ago now or four years ago now. So it's been a while, obviously, before recent right. history. Right. Um, but yeah, it's amazing because they've done a, a kind of a, a remake, I suppose you could say, uh, of the Amber Room. But right. And even though it's made out of so many of the same precious materials of the amber itself, so many semi-precious jewels and stones, you've got to wonder how much more spectacular the original one was and right. where it's ended up. And, you know, they've found segments of it around Ooh. in different places in Europe, like parts that they believe really were from the Amber Room, but they haven't found all of it. So that's hmm. fascinating. Yeah. That's I love these like. mysteries. I know the mysteries are always like the conspiracy theories. Like, where are they? like yeah. what, what is that? What's happening yeah. with that? Yeah. Jennifer, yeah. do you have any plans to write not to write fiction? I don't. I have no idea how to do it. As I was I talking to Zoe, it's so easy. It's oh, so easy. Oh, oh, she listens. You make to Zoe. it look easy. <laughs> I don't even know. I don't have any kernels to start <laughs> with. Oh my gosh! I, if I did, I would have to have Zoe give me like a a boot camp to teach me <laughs> right. how to do it. Because it is. It's it's not it, writing any book. Hats off to both of you for producing both of your books because <laughs> that is. To produce that is quite a feat and to get it through to publication is even a bigger feat. So congratulations to both of you on that. Thank you. Thank, yeah. you. Thank you. All right, ladies. It was fun seeing both of you again. Great to um, see you, Julie. Yeah. Vice versa. This was really great. And best of luck, Zoe, with the book and continued success with the podcast and everything, Jennifer. Um, Thank you. Love it. All right. Thanks, right. everybody. Make sure Thank you, you so book. much. Thank if you, Jennifer. Great work. to see you. Good night. Nice to see you both. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Good night. <laughs> Good night.